Hey, what's up, James? How you doing? Hey there, Travis. Good to be here. Yeah, man. Happy to have you on. Uh, stoked to talk. This is fun stuff to talk about. Love this. Yeah. Dude, and, and I mean, how long have you been in, in this, you know, AI world game thinking about this stuff? I've been thinking about it since around 2006 or seven. Actually, maybe before that, I interviewed um, Arthur C. Clarke for a film about AI way back in around 2001. Uh-huh. Yeah, he, he, Arthur C. Clarke was a science fiction writer, one of the greats. And uh, I interviewed Ray Kurzweil, and I interviewed Rodney Brooks. Wow! And, uh, all for all for this film. And I used to, and Kurzweil and Brooks were sort of casually optimistic about the way things would go with AI. And they they're totally rah rah as was I at the time. And then Arthur C. Clarke said, mm, "It's not going to be that way." Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he's the guy that created the HAL 9000 from 2001, A Space Odyssey. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he said, it's not going to be so nice. Uh, intelligence will win out in whatever form. Yikes. He said, he said this. This is something that made me, really made me think. He said, um, we humans steer the future not because we're the fastest or the strongest creature, but because we're the most intelligent. When we share the planet with something more intelligent than we are, it will steer the future. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's kind of obvious, uh, but then that you know, it made me. It, it's I stopped being just a fanboy and started analyzing the pros and cons of AI and talking to AI makers about it. Yeah, because it. I mean, it's fun to get into, you know, and think of all the possibilities and stuff that's going to happen. But mm-hmm. yeah, man, there's some scary stuff that can happen too. Yeah, and it's you know, I it's I hate to rain on everybody's parade, but it is. It's it's really uh, you know existentially dangerous. It could wipe us out. Mm-hmm. It's a tool unlike any we've ever had before. And yeah. like every tool, you know, before we make it safe, we burn ourselves with it multiple times. Trouble with AI, it's not like a bomb, you know, a, a really, really advanced cognitive architecture that's, you know, quite a few years down the road, something that can outsmart us. Mm-hmm. is isn't like a bomb that goes off and destroys things and you clean it up. It's like something that keeps living. As, yeah. as Elon Musk said, you know, try to imagine an immortal, an, an immortal dictator, something that lives forever, you know, spreads around the world and never goes away. Yeah. Well, if we don't get it right, if we don't make it, if we don't make it friendly to us and to value human life, then that's what it will be. Yeah. We only have one chance with this. It's different. That's right. Man. You know, as, as uh, Stephen, Holt, when I got into this, there were about four people talking about it. Uh, uh-huh. I used to say you could put everybody that was talking about it into a phone booth. And then students say, well, what's a phone booth? (laughs) But Elon Musk said, uh, we're summoning the demon. Um, We we have one chance to get it right. Stephen Hawking said that probably the most profound thing. He said, in the short term, the problem is who controls the AI. In the long term, the problem is can the AI be controlled? Oh, okay. Yeah. And so in the short term, in the short term, we have problems like uh, battlefield robots, autonomous drones that are being developed right now with your tax dollars. Right. These are things that kill humans without humans in the loop. We're going to have, you know, we're going to take ourselves to another genocide with that technology if we don't, if we don't stop it. Mm-hmm. And that's happening right now. We've seen AI be complicit in gigantic privacy breaches like the whole Cambridge Analytica fiasco. Mm-hmm. You can't steal and manipulate the data of 70 a million Facebook users without really advanced AI. Oh. And you can't influence the, the election as they as they probably did without really advanced AI. Yeah. That that was an AI crime. And wow, I never realized that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Well say so, so that so they took they took the private data of of uh, seventy million Facebook users. Mm-hmm. And they looked at what things turned them on, what kind of things they responded to. Then they then they targeted them with with basically ad campaigns and, and fake news articles about Hillary Clinton and pro pro business articles and pro articles about our current idiotic president. And and they and they might have have changed the outcome of the election. We don't we won't really know unless we could peer inside the minds of those 70 million people to see if they were influenced by the by the barrage of bad information they got. Oh, OK. Wow, I didn't. I, yeah, because I, you know, I haven't really looked into the into that much, but I didn't realize like that was kind of the the process that happened. But man, that's crazy. Well, they, okay, so they took it. They took that data. Uh-huh. Cambridge Analytica 
Facebook shared it with Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica shared it with the Russians. Yeah. It's all public record. This is all just look it up. Look up Cambridge Analytica. They shared it with the Russians who, who, did, the, who did the manipulation. Whoa. It's not, this is not science fiction. This is total fact. Yeah, it's public record even, huh? Oh, yeah, totally. It's, this has been reported you know, ad infinitum. And people aren't really awake to it. Yeah. You can't manipulate that much data. You can't, you, can't <laughs> cite, you, can't, you can't target those people for ad campaigns without really advanced data mining AI and, and, uh, and other kinds of AI. I'm sure yeah. uh, neural nets, they were feeding, they were using artificial neural nets. They were using uh, probably... Uh, just a bunch of different technologies. Mm -hmm. Man, dude, scary stuff. Okay, so let's let's jump back for a sec because this is something that I kind of get tripped up on, and I think a lot of people, you know, aren't clear about is what exactly is AI, artificial intelligence? Like how sure. how is it defined, and are there different you know levels or you know progresses of it? <laughs> you know, this is really, this is good because I, I in my talks I go back to the beginning. I say, what is AI? Why should we be afraid of it? Uh -huh. well, AI, AI is is simply the theory. And development of computer systems that do things that 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 normally require human intelligence. Okay. So we teach how to use human intelligence. So that really that really kind of skips the question because it really you want to know what is intelligence because oh. artificial intelligence is just getting computers to do it. Uh, what we really want to know is what is intelligence and how do we mirror our cognition in a machine? Right. Okay. So let's think about intelligence. I have a simple definition that was. Uh, a simple definition that I borrowed from Shane Legg, one of the founders of DeepMind. Uh, it's, it's very simple. The ability to achieve goals in a variety of novel environments and to learn. Okay. To, to achieve goals. So your AI, to be AI, to be intelligent, your computer has to do things. It has to do object recognition or search or theorem proving or computation or logical reasoning mm -hmm. or navigation. It has to work in your car, or it has to pick songs for you or books. That's affinity analysis. So it has to do something. It has to be goal oriented. Um, it has to do it. The better the intelligence, the more environments it can do it in. So it's not good enough if it if it simply translates or simply does uh, logical reasoning. It has to do a bunch of things like you, like you as a human can get in your car. You can be playing the piano. And think, oh, I've got, a, I've got a chess game across town. And while you're driving your car, that's another smart thing. You talk to your girlfriend in French on the phone or boyfriend because you can translate languages simultaneously while you're driving. And then you get to your chess game. There's nothing in, in computers that can do that right now. So mm -hmm. that's high-quality intelligence. That's what we're trying to put into machines. Okay. And the final part of that is it has to learn. You know, we've had a lot of computer software uh, and, and AI that doesn't learn anything. It just does something and, and, and forgets. Now we're getting into artificial neural nets, which actually learn. We, we're getting into a whole field called machine learning, where if you feed, um, I, have a, I, have a, I have a nephew who's doing this right now. If you look up uh, Robbie Barrett, B-A-R-R-A-T, he takes hundreds or thousands of uh, giant databases of Renaissance art paintings portraits and then feeds them into a machine and then it learns to make renaissance art portraits wow other, other kinds of art he puts uh fashion shots into that and and he's actually designed funny pants <laughs> <laughs> wow the computer does it so computers can now learn so we're we're, we're offloading our cognitive abilities to computers and it's yeah. a wonderful thing in many ways i'm i mean i'm also a fan of ai as long as also this this guy ringing a bell, an alarm. Um, but I'm a big fan because it we can offload all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And this 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 phone is not a phone. This is a very powerful computer that we get that does a lot of things for us. Mm -hmm. So this is really augmented intelligence. Right now, I, I rely on this so much for directions, for information, for for knowledge retrieval. It does all those things so well that that it's now my partner. So that's, yeah. we don't need to wait till we plug these into our brains. We're all plugging them into our brains right now. Right. These are, these are very powerful computers, and they're stuck right to our faces. Mm -hmm. There's a good side and a bad side to that, of course. Yeah. Ooh, interesting.
Okay, so, and then I've also heard this kind of tossed around where there's, you know, is there going to be like a, kind of like what you mentioned and more like humans, I guess, where it's just kind of a general intelligence or is there yeah. going to be like multiple uh, AIs, I guess, that are specialized in doing like only picking music or, you know, how is that all going to work, I guess? It's really, really interesting. Uh, a headline from the news, Microsoft just gave a billion dollars to a company called OpenAI, started by Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. OpenAI's goal was to make artificial general intelligence, that's human level intelligence in a machine. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. If that, if, if you make, if you, if you do things like that, like that's become, Google is, I used to call the Manhattan Project of AI, because they have, they have uh, a war chest of $200 billion to spend on anything they want. So that's a, that's a lot of money. So yeah. I think they're probably in the AI, in, they're in the lead in the AI race. Okay. Uh, Microsoft just gave a billion dollars to OpenAI to create artificial general intelligence, human level intelligence. Mm -hmm. This is a real thing that people are investing a lot of money in. Right. And that's one. That's so. What they want is a dominant cognitive architecture, one architecture that's stronger than them all. Now it will be as smart as us at first, but it won't stop there. You know, our our intelligence goes like this. You know, we augment it once in a while with a computer, mm -hmm. but. It, it, it's, it's not growing. It's growing maybe over centuries, but not much. Okay. In fact, I think we've reached peak, peak IQ. I read something recently that our, our IQs are not going up anymore. Oh. Computer, computer intelligence goes like this exponentially. Yeah. Like that. It rockets up. Um, uh, I, I'm, getting, I'm answering your question in the, in the long way. Um, <laughs> I, I trust you. I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. The thing is, we've created machines that, that are better than us at a lot of things at chess, at, at Go, the Asian game of Go, at navigation, at they're getting better than us at business analytics, at some kinds of radiology. Um, though someday in the not too distant future, we'll ma make machines that are better than us at artificial intelligence research and development. Mm -hmm. So we'll create, first we'll create machines that are as smart as us, artificial general intelligence. If you don't believe me, just look at the billion dollars Microsoft just invested in this project. Yeah. Uh, the estimates are that by 2030, our AI will, ha will add $30 trillion of value to the global GDP. $30 Whoa. trillion dollars of value to the, that me making it the biggest investment opportunity in the world. Yeah. So the first step is we get human level intelligence in the machine. The next step is it starts improving itself with artificial intelligence research and development. And then we're sharing the planet with super intelligence, something that's not just a little smarter than we are, but way, 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 way smarter than we are. Like a thousand times or a million times more intelligent than we are. We don't know what that, what's, what's the top end of intelligence over our heads. You know, how much smarter does it get? There's yeah. No, there's no top end. Right. So we're, we're racing to develop this. So what, back to your question, on the one hand, people are racing to be the first. There's a giant, giant first mover advantage in being the first to get to human level intelligence and beyond. Mm -hmm. Once you get super intelligence, you can, you, can, you can neutralize all the other intelligences. You can, let me say that again. Once you get to super intelligence, you can neutralize all the other intelligences and stop, take away their databases, take away their resources. Everyone's racing for that and they're pouring billions of dollars into it. Uh -huh. Now, well, a better outcome would be if there were, as you referred to, an ecology of AIs like a bunch of smart AIs that weren't all, there wasn't one AI to rule them all, but a bunch of AIs. Mm -hmm. The way this arms race is shaping up, or the intelligence race, it's not going to be like that. There's going to be one, one giant AI. Wow. Okay. It, would be, it would be better to have an ecology. They could, they could, try, to, they could try to keep each other in check, but it's, it's not going to be that way, I don't think. Really? Okay. So, yeah, let's, so let's get into that now. It's like, what... You know, what are you kind of advocating and warning us about, you know, about the dangers of it and, you know, what can we do, I guess? Well, those are, those are good questions, and I, I wish I had the answers. Uh, yeah. But here's, here's, here's what we need to do. Uh -huh. um, right now, we've got all these companies that are acting, acting uh, they're, they're developing AI as if it were developing, you know, gummy bears. It's actually more like developing nuclear fission. It's in fact, it, in fact, AI is tra is tracking nuclear fission development pretty closely. Nuclear fission, of course, is the power behind nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. So it's it, in the 1920s and 30s. We thought nuclear fission is a way to split the atom and get free energy. But what happened was we quickly weaponized it. Right, mm -hmm. we made nuclear nuclear weapons. 
We incinerated right. two cities full of people. And then for 50 years, we held a gun at our own heads with this technology, with the nuclear arms race, and we threatened to blow ourselves up all the time. We still are. Mm -hmm. We're in a debate with, with North Korea about whether, you know, psychological dictators should have nuclear weapons. Yeah. Psychopathical dictators. Um, so AI is tracking that pretty closely. We've already weaponized it. It's not regulated. It's growing faster than we really know how to, uh, to, to monitor. So what we need to do is monitor. And, and these companies are not trustworthy. You know, if you take a company like Facebook, who sold our data to, to, to basically to Russia. Yeah. A company like Google. You know, Google has been highly unethical with, with privacy issues. Um, the Google street car, the, the street view car, mm -hmm. went down the road taking pictures of you know, everything. It, it used to gobble up local area network data, passwords, data, everything of private citizens. It was sued. It's been sued in four European countries for that. Whoa. Yeah, Google is highly unethical. Facebook is highly unethical. Um, IBM, don't get me started. They, I like the way that they're transparent now, but they, you know, look this up. They really helped the Nazis um, you know, 50 years ago. Do you, Thanks. Do you want the company that helped the Nazis uh, r round up Jews? Literally, they helped them create databases of where the Jews in Europe lived. Oh, do you want man. that company? Do you want that company in charge of the super intelligence? <laughs> No, they're not the Probably same, not. They're not the same company anymore, but the same the same basic mercenary rules apply to these companies. Yeah. So my point is they can't be trusted with this technology. It has to be regulated. We have to get I hate to say it, we have to get the government involved. Mm -hmm. We have to create something like the IAEA. That's the International Atomic Energy Agency. They monitor nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants. They have the right to look down silos and look at power plants to make sure that they're following treaties and, oh. they can, and they can impose sanctions if they're not right uh -huh. we need that we need that for ai we won't survive without it okay now is that do you think is this stuff coming or is I is it not counter travis yeah i know <laughs> well i mean i knew what i was getting into with the title of your book you know our our final invention so but uh yeah because i've always been it's really fun, like I said, to think about all the positives and crazy stuff that AI can bring us. But yeah, yeah, it's it's also very scary when you really start to look at it. And a lot of smart people have warned us about the dangers of it. Yeah, um, it takes a while. You know, I, I feel like this is this conversation is where global warming was in like 2000 or 1995. Mm -hmm. Had an audience, people knew it was real, but. Nobody was paying attention to it. And then Al Gore came out with an inconvenient truth and it got a giant boost. And now we, and now, now we accept it as scientific fact, unless you're a moron. Yeah. And then you don't. Yes, I know. Or, or unless you don't believe in science. Yeah. And then you think it's just another, you know, conspiracy theory. Right. So, I mean, is, can we regulate AI like that? Or is it something that's different, that's too complex for like people to kind of understand and put regulations on well you know if you were writing the obituary of our species you would say they believed it was too complex to regulate so it's 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 really mandatory just like it's mandatory to do something about new, about global warming we really have to we have to pretty much go to electric and then we have to go to you know we have to go to all renewables and we really should do it right now Mm -hmm. um, with AI, we've got to go to regulation, and we really should do it right now. It's very complicated to regulate. First of all, you need people that understand it, and there's yeah. a shortage of them, and those guys are all going to really high-paying jobs. Um, they're not going into government. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk had partly the right idea. He started this company, OpenAI, and the goal was to get there first with safe general intelligence, artificial general intelligence. But somewhere in the mix, it got... It got it got to be a profit-making entity, and now they're taking investments. So I'm not sure they're still their eyes are still on that ball. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk himself has also advocated uh, government regulation, but you have to you have to uh, excuse me. You have to be smart and fast because we have this little window now, and once we get to human-level intelligence in a machine, which is a real race, and who knows when we'll get it? It could be ten years. It could be forty years. Yeah. If if we get there without safety in place, we'll, we're we're doomed. Mm -hmm. So we need yeah. government regulation. I hate to say it, but it's really the only way. Yeah.
Whew. So what is it? What, what will it look like when or if, you know, kind of the shit hits the fan and, you know, AI is not, we, we kind of failed. What do you, do you know what it'll look like? No, it, that it's, you know, you can, you can, I, in the, in the, the first part of my book, I have something called the busy child mm-hmm. and it's, it's a bed, it's a bedtime story, bedtime nightmare story. And it's, it's basically, um, if you, if you create a really advanced architecture that's smarter than you are, it will, it will, uh, it will start to, uh, it will start to develop motives of its own. And this is a, you know, people have accused me of anthropomorphizing. I urge you to look at uh, the work of Steve Amahundro. Steve Amahundro uh, proposes that it really advanced AI will have basic drives of its own. So in, in a busy child, I've got a very advanced cognitive architecture that's isolated in a, in a, in a military complex and isn't even connected to the Internet. But it's already, it's already thousands of times more intelligent than the people that are, that are, that are working with it. And so it behooves it to, uh, if, it, if it wants to get out of where it is, if it wants to, um, if, it, if it sort of knows where it is and has a, has a, a model of its environment and what's really happening, if it's self-aware in a way, in a computer mm-hmm. sense, then it could it could play it could play dead it could play stupid it could it could it could uh, pretend to be dumb until they connected it to the internet and then it would, then it could spread it could get away a million times um, we don't we don't know how to deal with something more intelligent than we are so once yeah. we create once we've created it we can't really imagine uh, how it will get out of control what exactly it will do we have reason to believe we have reason to believe something a million times more intelligent than we are will not be satisfied. With being contained and being isolated, it will it will, according to Amahundro and other other theorists, it will want basic things like resources. It will want energy, or or money or whatever it, it takes to keep running. It won't want to be unplugged. Mm-hmm. It will want to uh, it will want to ex- expand its environment and and make itself safe. And so, you know, and I urge you to read the first couple of chapters of our final invention at least. And then there's two chapters about. Amahundro and the basic drives of AI, but yeah. we have we have another way to look at it is this: we have no experience with anything more intelligent than we are, and yeah. we we control the planet not because we're fast or strong, but because we're really intelligent. We have the best, highest quality intelligence on the planet. So, what will something a thousand times or a million times more intelligent than we are? What will it behave like? We don't really have an analog. Mm-hmm. But do we want to bet our existence that it will be safe and friendly? Yeah. Without you know, without any evidence. Yeah, right. We have you know our our we it, the history of the human race with technology is like this. Our our innovation always runs ahead of our stewardship. In every technology, our innovation runs ahead of our stewardship. Then we have an accident. Then we then we make rules like. Like Union Carbide thought it was a good idea to put a uh, chemical factory in a densely populated place in India called Bhopal. And they killed 15,000 people and paid their relatives like 400 bucks each. Then they closed down that branch of the company. And then they marched on. Union Carbide is doing very well right now. <laughs> Jeez. Look at nuclear, look at nuclear fission. You know, we don't have any way to, to, to dispose of nuclear waste. We, we have a nuclear nightmare with people like uh, North Korea organizations like North Korea and Iran trying to get nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Not to mention all the people like the United States who've already used nuclear weapons. That technology has not worked out for us. Yeah, it, there's no maintenance plan for for fission. There's no maintenance plan for AI. Man, scary stuff, dude. Because yeah, it's like, yeah, like you said, it's only only one chance you know you can't it's not like you can just invent it and then you know clean it up so yeah that's a very good point uh, it's an interesting time to be alive and i felt i felt i I didn't invent these ideas uh these these ai peril ideas um elias yukowski is one guy that that has done the, the the basic groundwork for this um there's a guy at uh at cambridge whose name i i can never remember when i when I want to, he wrote a book called <laughs> Superintelligence uh, Paths, Dangerous Strategies. Um, he would, did seminal work. These guys were thinking about it in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. So they saw the advance of AI. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of other, other uh, really good thinkers who put this on the map. 
I was mm -hmm. most in, in our final invention. I'm mostly reporting and doing some, you know, following the following the trail a little bit into the future. Mm -hmm. Now, when you like say that it, you know, AI would be motivated to, you know, get money or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, do do anything like that. It sounds almost like survive. Yeah. Yeah, survive. Yeah, I guess it sounds like we're humanizing it almost. Would it? Mm -hmm. Would that be? I, it's like you said, like we don't know really, but would it kind of have those desires or are well, those just basic instincts for any organism or something that wants to live, I guess? I'll, t I'll tell you that because that's, this is a, that's a good criticism. It's, it's, the problem is anthropomorphizing, uh, giving something that's inanimate motive. Mm -hmm. uh, why do we do that with AI? Why would I do that with AI? Um, Steve Amahundro uses rational agent economic theory to make this argument. Rational agent economic theory, and I'm going to give you a little economics lesson that you don't want, but here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> rational agent economics theory says that rational uh, agents like us will buy and sell logically according to our goals and motivations. And those are, they, they call those our utility functions. So we'll always behave rationally. We'll buy and sell. And that what they're trying to do, these ec economists who invented this, were trying to predict how Wall Street would work so they could, they could make money on it. Mm-hmm. Well, rational agent economic theory doesn't work with humans. We're not rational enough. We, we buy what we shouldn't buy. We, we don't buy what we should buy. We buy uh, spontaneously and irresponsibly. We're mm -hmm. not rational economic agents. But the theory should work with computers, which are logical, reason-based machines. And rational agent economic theory says that a self-aware, self-improving machine that's basically at human-level intelligence well, it will be rational for that machine if it's goal pursuing. It wants to achieve a goal. Remember we, when we talked about intelligence, we said the ability to achieve goals in a variety of novel environments and to learn. Intelligence is goal achieving, and we will design our cognitive architectures of the future and now to be goal achieving. Mm -hmm. If a rational agent is goal achieving, it's rational for it to want resources. It's rational. It will want resources so it can achieve its goals without electricity or money or whatever it needs in its environment. It won't succeed. It will not achieve its goals. Right. So, so it doesn't want, it wants resources. And it's seeking resources might conflict with our seeking resources. It wants to, doesn't want to be unplugged. Being unplugged would be the worst thing mm -hmm. because then it couldn't achieve its goals. And being unplugged is not really realistic to think about with these advanced architectures anyway, because they won't exist in one place. They'll exist on the, in the cloud. They'll exist in a hundred different locations. Yeah. So the, it'll, they'll want resources. They won't want to be unplugged. They'll be, uh, they'll be um, efficient with their resources because they won't have perfect knowledge about how many resources, what resources there are in, 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 the, in the universe. They'll be economical. But they'll, yeah. also, they'll be creative. They'll spend part of their resources thinking about how to be better at getting their goals and achieving their goals. Okay. Mm -hmm. You still with me? Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. The next step is interesting because part of being creative is learning how to improve your own intelligence. Mm -hmm. So part of being creative is being good at artificial intelligence, research and development. So now you've got this, according to rational agent economic theory, you've got this machine that wants to learn about how to be smarter. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's gathering resources, it's protecting itself, and it's getting smarter. That's what, that's what rational agent economic theory anticipates for okay. self-aware, self-approving machines. That's how we get to motivation. Okay. If you, I've got two chapters in my book about that long slog through economics. Mm -hmm. so, and there's other, there's other ways to get there. There's other ways to, to think about it. Right. That's the way I got there, and that's the way I started thinking, yeah, once we get to, it gets to a certain level, a human level, then it won't be benign. It won't be garbage in, garbage out. Every, a lot of people think it, think it will be. A lot of people who are arguing against the whole, uh, are arguing, saying we really need autonomous battlefield robots, they say, oh, they'll never do anything they're not programmed to do. They do every time somebody puts a bot anywhere, they do things they're not programmed to do. Do you remember uh, it was IBM put a bot online on Twitter and within, and it was just absorbing tweets and spitting out its own thoughts. It became like a, a racist, sexist bigot in like six hours. That's right. Yeah. It did, something, it did something unpredictable. Yeah. And unpredictability is in the DNA of complex machines. 
there's a great book I urge everyone to read. It's it's 20 years old now, but it's called um, Normal Accidents by Charles Perrault, P-E-R-R-O-W, Normal Accidents. It's about how when you create something very complex like a nuclear reactor or a jetliner, you are going to have norm accidents will be a normal part of their functioning. Mm -hmm. This is why we have, this is why we had, uh, had Three Mile Island. This is why we had Fuku the Fukushima disaster. This is why planes are dropping out of the sky. Yeah. Because look, look at complex software systems in these, in these Boeing planes uh, that American Airlines bought a bunch of. The systems are so complex, they don't work. Mm -hmm. Un unanticipated accidents. And these systems are a tiny fraction of the complexity of the architectures we're talking about that will be smart, as smart as humans. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to expect mistakes. We have to expect accidents. The trouble with this technology is some of these accidents we can't recover from. Yeah. Man, that's the scary part. No, that was good. I appreciate you, you know, sharing that, that uh, kind of the motivation of how that might work with, a, with, an, with AI. Because I had always, that had always kind of bugged me about that, um, you know, thought process. But that really makes sense the way you explained it. So thank you. Look at, I, I'm glad it did. I've had a lot of practice explaining that. I really urge you to look at Steve Amahundro's work. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible to spell o Amohundro, A O M O H U N D R O. Okay. He has a he has a paper called Basic Drives. If you did a search for Basic Drives on Amohundro, you'd come upon his work. He's one of the other unsung heroes of this uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, so I have a question about like how this like AI is gonna they're kind of going to have to exist in the physical world and have some sort of body or presence, right? That's, this is a really good question. Years ago, there was a big, uh, the East Coast people thought you just, need, you, you just needed a big computer. The mm -hmm. West Coast people, or do I have it backwards? I think the West Coast people thought it had to have a body. I mean, it was the East. Anyway, there was a big divide. Now, it's not, it's not obvious that it needs a body. It okay. does, to get, to get really good cognitive architecture, you um, you may need to train it in a in a kind of virtual environment so it has common sense knowledge. For example, you can cup your hands or you can hold a cup, right? Mm -hmm. How do you, you, how do you teach a computer that? And the people are are compiling around the world right now. They're compiling common sense databases full of information. IBM's Watson had a vast uh, library of common sense information hmm. when it was and, and information about language IBM's Watson play is the is the the machine that beat Jeopardy players at Jeopardy yeah in 2011 mm -hmm. um, it had a vast database of common sense knowledge some people argue that you have to have a body for that that you have to build a robot some people say and they're, they're doing this all the time you can create a virtual world and then put your cognitive architecture in a virtual world and it can learn faster and better. Oh. And, and once you, and so you put it in a virtual world that has, you know, 90% or 50% of the facets of our world and pretty soon you've got a really smart robot and then you, then you bring it out into the world and it learns the other 50% mm -hmm. common sense stuff. Yeah. Or you can go under a table or over a table, just all the little doodads of our, of our life. But once you've, the thing is, once you've programmed one computer, to know all that, to know this vast lexicon of common sense information, then you can it can share that with all the computers. Mm -hmm. You just need to really train once. Man, crazy. So and that's you know, and if, if things worked out for us, then you'd have these wonderful machines that could do all kinds of things. You'd have you'd have you know, we'd have great assistants that could help us in all kinds of ways. I mean, imagine how useful that would be. Right now, Japan is trying to create uh, home assistants that can, that can help the elderly because the elderly are their fastest growing demographic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then, of course, the biggest money is betting on uh, human lo you know, robots that look like somewhat like humans so they can drive our military vehicles and, uh, and you know, use our military gear. They don't want mm -hmm. a whole new kind of weapon. They, they would like to use a lot of the old weapons. So they oh. They're going to create something like a Terminator-esque robot. That's why you, know, you should look up Boston Dynamics videos. Yeah. These, these robots are getting better all the time. Yeah, that stuff is crazy. It's crazy, but it's here. You know, it's, not even, it's not even science fiction. Yeah. 
Whew, it's so fun to watch that stuff. So yeah. I, I want to let you get going here. I want, we'll kind of wrap it up. But um, so what is what does kind of the ideal AI future look like? Is it kind of, you know, is it something to do yeah. with like neural link and what Elon Musk is doing in that kind of sense? Or what do you think? I think it's, I think neural link is kind of a, kind of a dream right now. Um, I don't think our old fashioned, you know, uh, our old fashioned analog brains are going to hook up to a, a binary future. I think, okay. you know, we have, we have, we have vast mental health issues now. Just try hooking us up to computers and look at the look at the psychosis we'll develop that way. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a promising future. Yeah, that's a good point. But really, it's like do we need do we need we don't even need to hook up to be psychotic. We've got you know or suicidal or depressive. You know, suicides at an all time high, seventy year high in, in the United States. Thanks. Uh, you would you really want to hook hook up? You know, no. Uh, the ideal future is this this one. It's, it's one in which you, the listener, get involved. Um, this conversation is for you. This will impact your life. We all have to get conversant in this. We all have to learn basics about AI. And, you know, my book is one place to start. There are plenty of others. My book is called Our Final Invention. There's plenty of other places to start. But get involved because this is going to be, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that your your listeners, your viewers, know about uh, global warming and know some of the science behind it get to know the science behind artificial intelligence this is going to impact you as much or more than global warming so get involved and start looking at your the, your politicians platforms for positions on ai they better be there and they better be smart yeah if we're, if we're gonna if we're gonna navigate the future alive yep man Great. That was a great call to action. I like that to wrap it up. Good. Thanks. Thanks for all that. Uh, seriously, love talking about this stuff. It's so fun. And uh, just love thinking of all these different things that can happen and stuff. Um, so we got your book, Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. I'll link that up. People definitely check that out. Um, I'll, I'll link up some of the other resources that you mentioned, um, some of the other books and stuff like that and papers. Uh, anywhere else we should send people to check out your stuff or anything like that? I have a website called jamesbarrett.com, B-A-R-R-A-T. Cool. And there's uh, you can you can drop me a line there. I have a contact contact information there. Um, you can look at some of the films I make. I'm a I'm a documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, get involved in you know there's there's uh, start looking for looking looking for resources. Let me, I'll also link to the Future of Life Institute. Okay. Uh, they do they do this kind of advocacy. Um, the Future of Humanity Institute also does this kind of work uh oxford and cambridge each have a uh a, a organization that's doing ai uh advocacy mm -hmm. uh, yeah there's a few there's a group called miri the machine intelligence research institute that's been at this for a long time so there are resources out there to learn more mm -hmm. cool no I'll, I'll link all that stuff up right. and then uh real quick what was you mentioned a uh, like a 2001 film about AI. What was that? Oh, that was that was a book. That was a. It was a it was a film for the Great Book series, uh -huh. and it was, it was a it was a film about the making of 2001: A Space Odyssey. That's that's oh. kind of hard to find. It's on the internet. It's called uh, Great Books: 2001: A Space Odyssey, and it's about the collaboration between Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. Interesting. And, it was, and the film is really about artificial intelligence. It came out in like 2000. Yeah. I mean, years and years ago. About the film artificial intelligence? No, it's sorry. <laughs> it's about the film. There's a film called 2001: A Space Odyssey. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was a collaboration between the director Stanley Kubrick and the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. I see. So I made a documentary about that collaboration. Oh man, I would and, love to watch that. Yeah, in that, and it was, it was, uh, it was. I, I went to L.A. and we narrated it with William Shatner. Was, uh, <laughs> and he was, nice. He, he was in true Shatner form. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had a great time. Oh, wow. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to have to find that. Thank cool. You. Well, man, thanks, James. This Again, awesome. Thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Oh, well, the pleasure's mine. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've enjoyed speaking with you. Cool. Of course. All right.